Welcome to our trading strategy update here. We're, today, we're going to cover how to trade strangles on futures. It's a course trading strategy that I use in my portfolios uh, to generate additional income. It's been probably one of the best trading strategies along with the 112 trade. Together, they make up probably 70 to 75% of all of the income that I'm able to generate uh, whether it's with the small portfolios of 10, 20K, uh, trading portfolios of two and a half to five hundred thousand dollars or more, or IRAs, any of those strategies, you can do these trades in there. Uh, so we're going to jump into why and how to trade strangles on futures. So let's jump into the session here. Uh, so let's talk about trading futures and why we trade futures. So number one biggest benefit for me trading futures is leverage. Uh, futures are high volume uh, entities here where uh, they're they're heavily traded. So uh, not only there's a, a lot of great leverage involved, uh, I guess we'll talk about liquidity in a, in a minute, but the leverage here, because they use span margin, the leverage is, is fantastic. It's better than, uh, in my opinion, better than PM in some, you know, in some cases, and certainly better than reg T margin uh, in almost all cases uh, here. So great leverage. You can trade uh, a larger amount of money with less buying power. Now, with that comes more increased responsibility and danger. So you got to be smart about it. Another great thing about trading futures is diversification. Uh, futures trades a whole lot of different types of underlyings uh, from commodities like agriculture, um, livestock. You can trade equity indexes. You can trade energy, oil, gas, uh, metals, gold, silver, bonds, currency, the Aussie dollar, British pound, euro, any of those all can be traded uh, using futures. Uh, so not only, again, are they heavily uh, you know, buying power friendly and good leverage items, uh, but they're diversified. There's a lot of different underlyings uh, that get high volume that you can trade. Uh, and then liquidity. Most futures are really very highly liquid. You can uh, easily trade in and out of most futures pretty well. Uh, another great advantage is the trading hours. Uh, the extended trading hours on futures makes them really, really attractive. You can trade nearly 24-6. Uh, so really from Sunday night through you know Friday late day, you can trade futures, which means you can trade them at night, you can trade them in the morning, you can trade them when the regular stock market's closed. Some great advantages there are you can get in and out of trades at optimal times um, and avoid lots of problems that could have, you know, potentially be waiting for people that want to trade, but, you know, the market's closed and they just don't have the ability to trade in the morning or get out of a trade that's going south overnight. You can do that on futures. Uh, so great trading hours on futures. Let's talk a little bit about those hours. Um, on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Here's some of the basic hours. There's some different tweaks in here, uh, but the hours of operation for futures, it, it varies based upon the specific exchange and the type of futures contract being traded. However, here's, here's some general trading hours for some of the major markets. Uh, so for equity indexes and currencies, uh, they trade basically Sunday through Friday from 6 p.m. till about 5 p.m. the next day. There is some trading halts for 45 to 50 minutes on some of these sessions. Uh, towards the end of the session, uh, and then they close for about an hour, and then they reopen. Uh, for financials and bonds, Sunday through Friday, again, 6 to 5 Eastern. Uh, energy and metals trade Sunday through Friday, 6 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. They're just closed from 5 to 6, uh, you know, on uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, and then Friday, obviously, at 5 p.m., they're closed until Sunday night when they reopen. Uh, grains are traded Sunday through Friday. They open 8 p.m. till about 2.20. This is something to, to be aware of uh, and maybe print this slide out and keep it again. It's not exact. It's very close. But Sunday through Friday, 8 p.m. to 2.20 p.m. So if you're trying to get in and out of a corn futures trade at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you can't do it uh, because they closed at 2.20 Eastern. Uh, so just be aware of that. And then meets 
you know, livestock, uh, lean hogs, what have you. Those are uh, Monday through Friday, basically 9 a.m. to a little after 2, 2.05 p.m. Eastern. Little less time in the market on, on meat. So you've got to be aware of it that, hey, if I'm trying to trying to make a trade at 8 a.m., I can't do it on meats. It doesn't, doesn't open until 9.30 in the morning, same as the market. You know, if I'm trying to get out in the afternoon, can't do it. They close at 2.05. So being aware of the trading hours before you place a trade. Uh, let's talk about margin. And uh, specifically, let's talk about span margin and what it is. I strongly recommend that you go do some due diligence and you go learn for yourself a little bit more about span margin. Talk to your broker. Get the ins and outs of how span margin works. Uh, but SPAN, which stands for Standard Portfolio Analysis of Risk Margin, it's a risk-based margining system uh, of portfolio risk. Um, so it's it's based on the concept of portfolio risk, and it assesses potential losses in a portfolio that a portfolio could face due to adverse point or uh, adverse price movements. Um, so it calculates requirements for futures and options contracts, but it does it on a portfolio level. Um, so it determines the amount of capital required to cover potential losses in a portfolio. So the span margin moves up and down based upon some of those tools. So what does it take into account? It takes into account price volatility of the underlying assets, potential interrelationships among the positions, and the specific risk characteristics of each contract that you have on. So it's going to really look at all of those things and it's going to determine what uh, what margin requirements on a daily or intraday basis it that your broker decides to put on your account. So once these factors are considered, it then calculates that margin requirement to re represent that total risk that it sees. Now, it's important to know that span margin can change based upon market conditions and the positions you hold. So again, closely monitor your, your margin requirements because if you fail to meet those um, requirements, then you might get a margin call and be forced into position liquidation. The differences between span margin and all other types of margin is it's a floating margin that will change a lot of it has to do with volatility. If the market starts to sell off quickly, volatility is going to going to head up, and your risk of loss is going to head up if you're long options. So that can be a lot of uh, additional buying power required. You could you know start the morning with uh, you know thirty percent buying power in a smaller account, and if the market starts to sell off really heavy that day, you can see that portfolio go up to fifty percent margin. You can see something from 50 go to 60, 70% margin in a day or two. If the market gets into a pretty good sell-off span of three, four, five, six days, a month, what have you, really it's going to be days. Um, but if you had three or four day really serious downtrend, we're losing 2% a day every day, uh, you know, $100 down on SPX every day, something like that. If you start to see that and it happens over three or four days and your margin can go, can double. Uh, your margin requirements can double from 30% to 60, 70, 80%, from 50 to 100%. Now you've got to start to uh, deal with how to deal with that span margin increase. So it's got its plus, the fact that it's got fantastic, I mean, like I said, the best leverage there is uh, on futures and options on futures. However, uh, be aware of span margin and how it can affect your account. So that's why I will never exceed if I can, 50% uh, uh, margin most of the time. And for smaller accounts, I recommend closer to 30, 40% uh, because they're much more heavily affected because they have less positions. Thus, uh, a position or two going bad or the market going bad really can jack your spam margin up. In a larger account, you typically have a lot more positions and diversification on. So it may not move at quite the same uh, ratio or speed, but you gotta be aware uh, of that. So there are some people out there that you know keep their buying power related to the VIX. I'm not really married to the VIX. I think it's kind of a broken indicator now. Uh, I know Bobby Gaines is one out there. 
uh, recommends around, I think, 30%, but it all he he's very specific as to what VIX levels uh, you have to determine what margin requirements. When your margin gets up to, um, or VIX gets up over 30, 40, 50%, then I think he's willing to go closer to 50. When his margin requirement, when VIX is lower, like 15 to 20, he's down closer to 30%. It's a good rule of thumb for some of you, but it's, to me, it's a lot for smaller accounts. I think it's great to be conservative uh, on it uh, until you really understand how things can move. Then you can get a little bit more aggressive, maybe closer to the 50% that I'm using. Until then, stick around that 30% and be smart about it. Uh, all right. Um, so why strangle? Let's just jump into strangles themselves here. Again, for me, simple mechanical trades. And you know I love something simple, something mechanical that doesn't take a lot of work to put this on and figure it out. It's also a delta neutral strategy. I am a huge delta neutral guy. If you've read any of my trading plan, you know where I like to keep my deltas. You know I like to be as delta neutral as humanly possible. And there's nothing more delta neutral than strangles. Um, he has a little skew on him, but for the most part, it's a very delta neutral strategy. So adding more on doesn't really affect my deltas uh, until it starts to move. No complex technical analysis is needed. You don't need to have 19 screens open and be looking at order flow and stochastics and RSI and all kinds of moving averages in this trade. You know what? You can simply eyeball a chart, tell pretty much whether we're in a serious uptrend or downtrend. And even so, does that really affect the strangle? Uh, because if you believe that most things are going to mean revert at some point in time, that's the whole purpose of the strangle is yeah, it may move one direction a bit on you and then it will mean revert. And that's really when you, you uh, benefit the most. Um, also, strangles can be scaled for different account sizes. So no matter what your account size from 10K or 20K all the way up to millions uh, in your account, Strangles can be used for almost any size account. You can just scale them in multiple different products that you can use. Um, strangles have a high win rate, especially the way I trade them. So they're a very high win rate on there. They're also pretty easy to adjust if needed. I'm not a big fan of adjusting strangles. Uh, so I do not subscribe to the, the tasty trade ray of rolling the untested sides in or out. I find as many times as you do that, you could also get whipsawed. I don't go inverted and all these other, I don't need to adjust 19 times. Okay, put it on, have a set of rules, take it off, make your money and keep your life simple. So you're not paralyzed by staring at a screen all day, all right? Um, so let's talk about the basics of the strangle here. If you're not familiar, we sell both a call option and a put option with the same expiration date, but different strike prices. Uh, we expect that the underlying asset is going to stay within that range until expiration. So somewhere below the call, somewhere above the put, we want it to stay inside that range until expiration. Uh, for the call option, we're going to sell an out of the money call and the put, we're going to simultaneously sell an out of the money put option. And we generate income at the open since we're selling both options, which means we're obligated to buy them if the stock price gets to that amount. Okay. Uh, we will lose if the price of the underlying moves significantly in one direction and goes after one of our two strikes or tries to surpass one of those two out of the money options. That's where we lose. Otherwise, you're betting that we're going to stay inside that range for the duration or a portion of the duration of the trade. All right. So let's look at risk and sizing. As always on my trades, never risk more than 2% of your portfolio value on any one trade. I can't emphasize this. I know some people ask me some questions about, yeah, but they're unlimited risk because it can go to zero. It could. If anything goes to zero, we got more problems than uh, the unlimited risk that you have on that trade. Uh, because if, if oil goes to zero tomorrow, the world is ending. Um, if the S&P index goes to zero tomorrow, the world is ending. Okay. If not, we're moving strongly in one direction, so we don't lose more than 2%. If you have a $10,000 account, we're not risking more than $200 on the trade. That's our max loss. Okay. If you have a $50,000 account, you can risk $1,000 as your max loss because we have stop losses. So those stops 
that's where we want to size appropriately to. Okay. If it's a small account, I will probably go up to closer to 5% of your portfolio value. For larger accounts, 2% is where I typically trade around. Also, don't allocate more than 30% of your available trading buying power uh, to any strategy. Your available trading buying power, to me, is around 50% of my net lick. For others, it might be 30%, 40% of your net lick. Whatever buying power you're going to allocate to be able to trade, bearing span margin in mind, whatever that number is, I'm not taking more than 30% of that for any one strategy. Uh, and considering this is one of my core two or three strategies, I won't risk more than 30% of my available buying power. Let's say you have a $250,000 account. I will only use $125,000 in buying power, and I will not use more than 30% of that or 37,500 in buying power to allocate to any particular strategy, okay? I'd like to use really three to four core strategies. Also understand from a risk standpoint that again, you can be assigned the shares of your out of the money calls or puts, okay? So there's some risk there. Uh, the risk is not going to zero, even though it is, it's not. The risk is actually going past your strikes and getting assigned at those strikes. And potentially if it went past by a significant amount, you already own the stock now at a loss or you own the future at a loss. Now you have some decisions to make. You can wheel it. You can roll it. There's all kinds of things you can do if we get close or get assigned. Uh, so understanding those risks. So let's look into how I structure my strangles on futures. I'm very mechanical on these. Uh, you can ask me all kinds of questions about, well, what about 45 DTE and you know, doing things the tasty trade way? I don't do anything the tasty trade way except for closing things at around 21 DTE. All right, everybody's got their own ideas on how what works. I know what works for me. So I like to go out between 80 to 100 days till expiration. 90 for me is perfect. Not 45, not 60, 90. I found that the decay at 90 day T DTE is not much difference than between a 45 and 60 DTE. It gives me more credit. It gives me more safety out in time. Uh, so I make good income with great safety with similar decays. Uh, on these trades. I do find on average, on average, that I will hit a 50% profit target in 30 days, most of the time on average. Uh, and I give you some statistics about that uh, in a bit, but on average, 28 to 30 days is about where I'm in a trade when it hits 50% profit target, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And again, the farther out, we don't have those gamma um, particular, you know, issues that we run into on the trade. All right, so let's take a look at the strike. So now we know we're gonna go out to 90 days and I'm going to sell a short put uh, or sell a put. Um, so that put that I sell, I'm gonna do puts around seven delta, okay? I'll tweak it a bit here and there depending on open interest. Uh, and then the calls, I'm gonna go up to about six delta because of skew and the fact that call side is gonna be closer to at the money, okay? A six delta call is not as far away as a seven delta put, okay? I'd like to be farther away on the calls or, or, or lower delta if you wanna put it that way. I like the lower delta on the calls because markets always go up at some point, okay? Yes, you're gonna have sell-offs. Yes, you may have recessions. You can have all kinds of things, but eventually they start to move up again. I don't like to be short the upside and be tight on the upside. Even when I think the market's gonna is overbought, it can stay overbought for long periods and go even higher, like we're seeing right now. So these are low delta strikes, but when using span margin, the leverage is fantastic. So we get a solid return on margin and improved safety at the same time on low delta options. Okay. I'm going to look to take in around 25 to 30 percent credit to my buying power as my ratio. So let's take a look at what one of these would look like here. Uh, here's a good uh, example of a trade on CL futures uh, using options and CL is oil. And right now I'm looking to uh, maybe put on a strangle on oil here on the uh, Tasty Trade platform here. I would be looking at the, and I'm, I'm gonna go into the platform here and we'll, we'll go through this one, but you know, looking at a, a 53, uh, 
put, so the put at 53 is right around 7%. And I'm going to sell the 93 call, which is around 6%. I'm going to put on three contracts here at 76 cents. Now, oil, understanding oil is a 1000 multiplier. And that's something I really didn't cover too in depth with you here, but each options on futures has its own multiplier where SPX and standard stocks have a $100 multiplier, meaning you buy, you sell an option, one option, you control 100 shares. In futures, each underlying has a different multiplier. Oil, 1,000, okay? If you're looking at silver, it's 5,000. I'm just giving you, if you're looking at corn, it's 5,000. If you're looking at the Aussie dollar, it's a 100,000 multiplier. If you're looking at lean hogs, I think it's 40,000 on lean hogs. Yeah. And uh, if you're looking at, uh, you know, some of the others out there, uh, if you're looking at nat gas, it's uh, 10,000 as your multiplier. So know your multiplier before you place the trade. So I'm trading, let's use a 250 thousand dollar account as an example my max risk on that account would be around five thousand dollars okay so and i haven't talked about stop losses yet but my stop my loss is going to be uh at a 2x loss so 2x the credit received you can see on this slide the max profit here uh, which is my credit i'm taking in two thousand two hundred and eighty dollars okay $2,280. How do I get to that? Well, the contract is 76 cents. It's got a 1,000 multiplier because it's oil, which has a 1,000 multiplier. And I'm looking at three contracts. Okay. So that's 760 times three, 2,280. That's how you get that. Technically, the max profit or the credit I'm taking in is 2,280. You can also see that my buying power on this trade is 72.12. So it's only using $7,000 in buying power to make $2,200 potentially in credit. Even though I'm not going to let it go to expiration, if I did, that's where I would be getting to. And if you look at my probability of profit on here, over on the left-hand side there, it's 89%. So we got a 90% chance that we're going to stay somewhere in this range by expiration. And if we did, and we held it all the way to the end, we'd make $2,280. You can see Delta is almost at zero on this trade. Uh, and we have decent theta on this trade uh, as well. So um, it's a solid theta trade, which is going to be roughly 56 bucks a day times three contracts, about $168 a day. Great, uh, uh, great theta ratio on strangles. Let's take a quick look at the plat trading platform and see what it would take if we just put one on now so oil's open i think it's about to close but uh, let's take a quick look if i was trading oil cl is my symbol it'd pull up all these different contracts here that you can see different expirations i would go out close to 90 let's take the 88 days that's close i'm going to zip on down here to around seven delta i go typically pick the highest open interest around seven I'm going to zip on up here to the calls, pick something here around that uh, six delta overall. So I'm taking in right now $81 on this trade. So it's a little better than it was earlier today when I made that screenshot for you. Uh, so three contracts, 2,400. If my loss would be twice this, so I, I'm risking, if I stopped out at a 2X loss, I'd lose 2,800, $2,800. Let's again say I have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar account. Okay, is one percent. So I'm not even risking one percent of my account on this trade, assuming I can get out and on the timely fashion with no slippage. Uh, but you have really, you know, really tight bid asks, really good uh, open interest on most strikes, and I'm already out ninety days. Imagine what happens when you start to get tighter on these things, and you start to get within eleven days or so. Um, you really start to uh, uh, to work your way up um, on really tight bid asks as well. So uh, you've got really good uh, opportunities in here. So again, that is how I would trade that particular 
uh, piece. If I was going to do the same thing on corn, ZC, I'd go out. Now, corn, I have a 67 or 158. Well, 158 is way too far. 67 might be a little too close for me, but if I wanted to do it, I could take the 67. I'd go down to about seven delta. Let's say that's the 405 on corn. I'd go up to about six delta. Okay, I'd go to the 830 here. So for one contract of corn, okay, one contract of corn, eight thousand seven or eight, you know, eight eight dollars and seventy five cents. I'm really looking at a buying power, and it might this might be mixed up because I have some other trades on. You know, look at that, six hundred dollar buying power for a four hundred dollar credit. Uh, pretty incredible what you can do here. Which means if you even wanted to, you can slip out even further on these strikes okay. to maybe three or four delta, still take in really great um, profit ranges on these things. And I would size up until I get to approximately, you know, uh, if again, $250,000 you know, trade, I might be willing to risk $5,000. So I can go maybe 10 contracts for 2,500 on this because a 2X loss is five thousand dollars which is two percent of you know my max my, which is my max loss hopefully that makes sense to everybody so you can even get wider than i am but uh obviously the wider you get the slower your decay would be so that's really how you trade these uh particular um, options on futures pretty simple um let's talk quickly about the trade exits on these I will look for a 2X loss on credit received. So my credit's 1,000, I will close once I've lost 2,000, which means it's a 3X stop to take in a 2X credit, okay? 2X is the max loss, 3X is the stop loss. Profit targets are always 50% for me. I will exit at 21 days to avoid any additional gamma risk. It is rare that I ever get to that point. I'm gonna either hit my profit target or my loss probably well before 21 days. Um, and then lastly, for me, I don't adjust strikes during the trade. I don't roll the untested sides. I don't do any kind I don't go inverted for the love of Pete. I don't do anything crazy. I don't need inverted trades. I don't need to go to roll my untested up because as soon as it mean reverts and it blows past, now you're inverted. Now you got a problem uh, because you rolled your calls up or down. And now the thing took off or I rolled my puts up because this thing's been in a rally. As soon as you roll your puts up, you'll mean revert and it'll drop and it'll blow past your strikes or it'll put pressure on your other strikes. So I just don't like to deal with that and then have to keep adjusting and adjusting and then rolling. Okay. I, rolling is taking a loss and establishing a new trade. To me, rolling is bananas. Okay. You're technically taking a loss and then expect hoping that the same trade is going to eventually be right sometime in the future and you'll just roll until you're right i'd rather just take my loss put on a new trade and be right on the new trade as opposed to rolling and hoping that eventually i'm right if i'm wrong i'm wrong i close okay i don't adjust that's me not saying you have to do anything okay um and then a, a couple last pieces here again 30 percent of my available trying um Trading buying power goes to this strategy. Uh, so I do allocate 30% of what's available from my buying power. Uh, I usually have anywhere from four to six of these trades running at all times uh, on a $250,000 or $300,000 or $500,000 account or whatever. I'll at least have four to six of these running. Normally, they expire every 30 days. I hit my 50% profit target. So because of that, if I have four to six running, and all four close within 30 days, I'm generating, you know, money every month on these. And you saw that if I was taking in, let's say a thousand or two thousand dollars in credit, if I'm closing at 50%, I'm making 500 to a thousand per trade on good buying power. Uh, and I'm going to keep, uh, you know, doing four to six, but I won't do four on you know, oil or four all on gold or four all on the Aussie dollar here, I will move them around different strikes. So I tr I prefer trading ES futures, which is the S&P futures, CL, which is oil, GC, which is gold, 6A, which is the Aussie dollar, 
6A, which is the Euro, um, HE, uh, as well as ZC and ZS and ZB. So ZC is corn, ZS soybeans, ZB bonds. Okay. I will trade any of those uh, different underlyings out there. Those are some of my favorites. I don't get too crazy into other things uh, that can move up and down. And I won't trade all of these all of the time. Uh, but I do uh, like to have a, 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 a good spread of these on because it gives me a chance uh, to be diversified because if the market's going down, oil may not. Aussie dollar may not. Lean hogs, HE, may not. Corn may not be dropping if the market's dropping. Okay. If the Aussie dollar is going up, how does that affect the price of corn and soybeans? It probably doesn't. Okay. Everything's got loose correlations, but you know, if bonds are going up, is the you know, market may be going down, but is oil affected by bonds? Are hogs affected by bonds? Is what's going on in the gold market affecting corn? No. So you get a pretty good amount of diversification using just about seven or eight underlyings. Uh, and if I'm, but if I do use the same underlying, I just spread the expirations and strikes around. So if I am going to do two ES trades, then I want them to be, I want them to have different strikes and potentially different expirations. Okay. I don't, otherwise I'm putting on the same trade twice. I'm doubling my risk. Uh, I want to have my risk spread around. I diversify by strategy and not necessarily by underlying. I don't need 50 different stocks. Okay. I only trade one stock and that's Amazon and I trade a bunch of different futures and that's it. Okay. I could care less what Meta is doing today or tomorrow or Nvidia or Tesla. It's great. Trade those all you want. Knock yourselves out. I've really tried to pull back on doing those things because all it takes is one knucklehead to come out and say something at a conference and wreck your stock. Um, and people to take it the wrong way and Al goes to get a hold of it and they rocket the price up or down and then it'll normalize. Um, now, the last piece here is I do place trades on ES and GC strangles every week. It's a separate strategy. I'll cover it in another video, but I do a weekly strangle on ES and GC futures every single Wednesday. I put one on and take one off. Okay. I ladder up to four of each, one per week. Once I've got the four, then I'm always adding one, taking the most profitable off, adding a new one, taking the most profitable off. So I'm spreading out risk on strikes. I'm spreading out risk on expirations. Uh, and those have been fairly consistent winners uh, for us. So hope this was helpful for you. How to trade strangles on futures. One of my core trading strategies. Good luck on this. It's a fantastic trade opportunity. We wish you the best of luck trading. If you like this video, click the like button. If you want to see more of this, subscribe. I try to answer as many comments as I can. I don't always catch them all. Uh, and if you want to see uh, some of the live trading that I do, it's down there in the uh, descriptions as well. If not, we'll keep sharing trading ideas with you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.